Well, Peter Pan is a boy who grew up having probably more adventures than many of us could ever hope for. He got to play around with mermaids and have battles with pirates along with his lost boys. He could fly, which, I mean, who doesn't want to be able to fly? He had Tinkerbell as fairy companions. But the most significant about thing about Peter is that he was known as the boy who wouldn't grow up. Spent all of his time in Neverland with the other lost boys. And the main thing about Peter is that he never got older. And while it's fun and it's whimsical, if you've read the books, it's also a little bit annoying because he acts like a kid who won't grow up. He's constantly changing his mind. He's incredibly selfish. He's really, for me, when I read and listened to it a little bit with Brian, I just found him totally insufferable because he just drove me nuts. Why? Because he just wouldn't grow up. And that's eventually why Wendy, you know, the, the people that we know had to leave. And they couldn't stay in Neverland because eventually you need to grow up. That's part of being a human. Well, this morning we, we see in the church in Corinth is much like Peter Pan in that they were a church who wouldn't grow up. This is one of Paul's main frustrations, main problems that he has with them is that they are not maturing spiritually. They are just like Peter in Neverland, staying per, as perpetual children, never ever getting more and more mature. So this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about spiritual maturity. And we're going to see really um, three marks of spiritual maturity along with an application. And so the, what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, chapter 3, um, and we're just going to see all that Paul has to say um, to the church about their spiritual immaturity. Um, so if you can follow along with me in your Bibles. But I, brothers and sisters, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready for it, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving in only a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one. And each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. And someone else is building upon it. Now let each take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold and silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw... Each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. And if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple, and that God's Spirit dwells within you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world, or life, or death, or the present, or the future, all are yours. And you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. Let's pray. Lord, I just ask that you would open our eyes this morning. Lord, you would open up our ears to hear your word. Lord, would you help teach us how to not be like the Corinthian church? Would you help all of us to continue to grow up spiritually to become more and more like you. We pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen. All right, so the first mark of spiritual maturity, um, if you're taking notes, is that the spiritually mature person continues to grow in Christ-likeness. 
the spiritually mature person continues to grow in Christ's likeness. Now, that continue is kind of the, the key phrase here. But first, what we probably need to do is I need to define what do I mean by spiritually mature. Because it's a word we can use a lot, we can toss around, and just like anything, if we don't define our terms, it can lead to us talking past each other or misunderstanding each other. We end up arguing and we're not even talking about the same thing. But so when I'm saying spiritual maturity, what I mean is somebody who is becoming more and more like Jesus. That's what spiritual maturity is. It's as you mature, just like as you mature as a human being, you get older and older. Well, as you get more mature as a Christian, it's not that you get older in years, but you get more and more Christ-like. So it is so, the spiritually mature person is not somebody who is perfect. It's not somebody who is exactly like Jesus. But it's if you looked at them five years ago and you looked at them now, they are more like Jesus now than they were then. They are more patient now than they were then. They are more... They deal better with suffering than they used to. They are kinder to others. They are more generous with what they have. Everything about them continues to get more and more like Jesus. That's what spiritual maturity is. It is a continuous path. Or sanctification is another word that we like to use to describe it. Because, right, it is a process, but it's something that should continue. Now, the immature person, the immature believer, is somebody who refuses to grow up. They stay forever in spiritual neverland. They never get more and more and more Christ-like. Now we know, and I'm learning this more and more every day, watching children grow up is an absolute blast. Right? It is so fun, especially when you're not having to deal with all of the diapers and all the other stuff, to just watch children continue to mature. Seems like with my two boys, it's every six weeks, every couple times, there's some big change and things just get more and more different. I remember growing up as a child, it used to drive me nuts. So every time an adult would see you go, wow, you've gotten so big. Uh, yes, that's what children do. Why is this amazing? Leave me alone. Let me go do my thing. <laughs> right? That's kind of how kids react. But now as I have kids and gotten older, I realize, yeah, it is amazing. This is so cool. So if you haven't seen a child for a while and you see them again, they're twice as tall, they're running, they're t- you can have a whole conversation with them. Like It's fun to watch children grow up, isn't it? Well, Paul is coming, he's writing to the Corinthians, he's like, hey, you know, I'm here, I, you know, I want to see how you guys have grown up, and he goes, wow, you are exactly the same. <laughs> that is not good. I've been gone a while, and you're still in spiritual diapers. So what he's saying, and, and one, you know, I wish I could address you as spiritual people, but you guys are just infants in Christ. All the same, you guys are a bunch of babies, a bunch of spiritual babies. This is kind of some harsh words from Paul. Because they are not getting more and more like Jesus. They haven't changed at all since the last time that Paul has been there. Instead of becoming more and more like Jesus, what's actually happening is they're becoming more and more like the world. This is what he says, you know, I could wish I could dress you as spiritual people in one, but you're actually people of the flesh, And I wish I could give you milk and not solid food, but you weren't ready for it then, and you're still not ready for it. There's supposed to be this natural progression in the spiritual life as we become more and more like Jesus, some days quicker, some days slower. But if you get a big picture, right, we're heading that way. But they are not. Instead, they're heading for more and more like the world. For verse 3, you are still of the flesh. There's still jealousy and strife among you. You're behaving only in a human ways. What is your problem? We talked about this last week in chapter 2. We were talking about part of the difference between the natural man and the spiritual man. This is a theme all throughout the book of 1 Corinthians that Paul hits over and over. And he says, no, you guys are spiritual now, right? You've been changed. Oh, but you guys aren't acting like you've been changed. You're acting just the same. He's surprised what they're doing, this whole discussion over the milk and solid food. Sometimes we can get into the weeds whenever it comes to Bible metaphors, and we can try and figure out what exactly is the milk, what does that symbolize, what does the meat symbolize. Let's rip that up, you know, let's go chase that. I, I don't want to chase that rabbit this morning, so I'm not going to. Um, I post a little devotional on our church Facebook page where I talk a little bit about it if you want to hear that, or you can pull me aside. I can tell you more of my opinion on that anyway. But what I think Paul is doing is not trying to make some point about what milk is and what food is. He's trying to say, y'all are a bunch of babies. Why are you still breastfeeding? 
If you went to someone's house and there was an 8 or a 12-year-old and they were still breastfeeding or drinking formula, that would make you get kind of, you know, uh, what's going on here? There's something wrong. Okay, no, we stop doing that eventually. You need to be growing up. But they're not growing up. Instead of going, going, coming more and more like Jesus, they're becoming more and more like the world. But the spiritually mature person continues to grow. That's the immature person doesn't grow. They stay the same. They stay stagnant. The spiritually mature person, it's not that you reach this level. This is the level of spiritual maturity. Anything below that, you're just an immature Christian. No, it is not about where you are at. It's all about the trajectory of your path. Are you becoming more like Jesus today than you were yesterday? Or more this month than you were last month? Or more this year, these last five years? Because what we need to do is we need to, and this is what Paul is calling them to do. He's saying, you need to live in light of who you actually are. The reason he doesn't call them naturally, he uses this people of the flesh and human and you're acting like the world, is because he's trying to say, y'all aren't natural. Y'all have been spiritually reborn. Jesus has changed your life. You've been given new life by the gospel, but it doesn't look like it. You're not acting like it. What he's calling them to do is to live in light of who they actually are. To live not as fleshy people, but as spiritual people. And the thing we have to remember here, and this is what can be hard for us, one of the, the main takeaways that I see in this section, is that age does not equal maturity. And, and we know that when it comes to regular age, don't we? We can all think of people who seem much older, they should be fairly mature, but they still act like Peter Pan, they just act like children. Seems like they've never quite grown up. They've never outgrown some of those childish behaviors. Well, that's true in the natural world. That's also true and can be true, unfortunately, in our spiritual lives. Just because you have been a believer for 50 years does not mean that you have had 50 years of spiritual growth and now you've reached spiritual maturity. We need to see this as a warning from the church in Corinth that you can be a Christian for a long time and yet not become more like Jesus. So what does the spiritually mature person do? We have to slowly continue in our growth. And that should lead us to look inward at ourselves and really be honest and evaluate and say, man, am I really still growing? Not am I becoming more knowledgeable, not am I learning more things, but am I acting more like Jesus than I used to act? And how is that working out? So that's the first mark of spiritual maturity is that it is a continued growth in Christ-likeness. It doesn't stop. The second mark of spiritual maturity is that the spiritually mature person humbly accepts their role. The spiritually mature person humbly accepts their role. Now, this is a lot of what Paul does here, kind of in 5 through 9, and then again this last section where he's talking about pride in 18 through 23 at the end of it. And part of what he's getting into, he starts this discussion on, you know, what is Apollos and what is Paul and, you know, somebody's planting, somebody's watering, and he starts using all of these metaphors. What he's doing is saying, he's using this as ample to show what the Corinthian church doesn't get because the immature person does not recognize the role that God has given them. What the immature person does is they, the immature believer walks into a room and thinks that they are the most important person. They think that they are the person who has accomplished everything. They think that they are the person who is the star of the show. But what Paul is saying is, look, it's not about being the star. Because what is Apollos and Paul? If anyone should be stars, it should be us, right? I planted this church. Apollos is the Greek superstar, okay? But we're not stars. We are just servants through whom you believed. That's a roundabout way of saying, hey, you know, you're, you're believers because of our ministry, but he's not even saying, hey, it's because I'm so awesome that you're even a Christian. He's just saying, I'm just a servant. God just used us. We were just playing a role. You think of uh, William Shakespeare famously said, you know, all the world's a stage and we are but players. Well, there's some good spiritual truth in that. And that all of us really are actors and playing a role in God's plan over the cosmos. But the problem is that the Corinthians believe that they are the star of the show. Okay, if you had a play, right, everybody wants the lead. Okay, everybody wants the most lines, the big solo, 
the big number, want their name up on the banner so that everyone can come down to the Simmons Center and see them in all of their glory, right? But what if somebody got, you know, they're not a speaking role. They're just ensemble member number five. Okay, that's not quite as spectacular. It's not exciting. Well, what if that person decided, you know what? I'm just going to interrupt that solo and start singing my own song. And then they start, you know, not being in the background. They just start pushing everybody to the side and trying to make the play about them. Okay, that for part of me would find that humorous um, and then embarrassing and then find the problems with it. But, the, you know, the cynical or part of me would just laugh at it and find it funny. But that's what the Corinthians are doing. They are, they are not accepting the role that God has given them. They are believing that they are the most important person in the room. And what this is doing is this is leading to all of their boasting. In 18, they are deceiving themselves, thinking that they are wise, thinking they are the most important. Again, this, this theme that Paul has hit over and over in every chapter about they believe that they are wise instead of accepting their role as fools. And it's leading in 21, let no one boast in men. Why does he have to say that? Because they're just doing lots and lots of boasting. They think they are the most important person. They think, really, they did all of the work. That's why it's getting in this discussion over who, who gave the growth. Kind of in 5 through 9. Who's the one that's actually causing all of this to happen? Well, what their Corinthians doing is they're pointing two thumbs at themselves and saying, this person, I made this happen. This church is only here because of me. You wouldn't believe how much I've given to this church. You, you wouldn't believe, Paul, how much... Blood, sweat, and tears I've put into this church. That's why we exist, because of me, because of what I've done. This wouldn't be here. You're so lucky that I'm here. That's, what, that's the Corinthian attitude. Now, I couldn't help but think of, as I read this, of the, the great theologian, um, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. One of the things that he would say, <laughs> yes, that, see, yeah, that was a joke, I'm glad. But he would always say, one of his catchphrases when he was in his professional wrestling was, you know, hey, know your role. And shut your mouth. It's a good paraphrase, I think, of what Paul is trying to tell the Corinthians. Guys, you need to know your role, and you need to be humble, and you need to stop boasting, and you need to shut up. Knock it off. Because the mature person understands that they're not the reason God is doing such great things. They humbly are just happy to do whatever it is that God has given them to do. They just want to play their part. So why are you saying in 5, we are just servants through whom you believed as God assigned to each. What does he mean by that? He's saying, you know, a lot of you came to faith in me, Paul. Why? Not because I'm awesome, but because God let it happen. A lot of you came to faith in Apollos. Why? Not because Apollos is a great speaker, but because God let it happen. Why? You know, I planted, I planted this church. Apollos watered, he did work. But the only reason this grew is because God gave the growth. This didn't grow because of me. This didn't grow because of you. This only has grown because of God. And in case they didn't get it in seven, so neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. Wait, so neither, he who plants, he who waters, they, they're pretty good. They're doing good, important work that's vital to the kingdom. Um, and then God can use it. No, no, no. It says neither of those are anything. Only God who gives the growth. God is the one who does it all. So what is our role? Our role is to just do our part. What is it that God has given us? Is it that we are the star of the show? Is it we're back doing the lights? Is it that we're off to the side handing out tickets? I don't know what it is, but what it is is, hey, God's the one ultimately who does all of it. So what we should do is do whatever God has given us with a smile and with humble acceptance and be excited to see what God is going to do as he makes it grow. Because he is the one who does all of the real work. And he's, he's laying that out saying, this is what the spiritually mature person does, is they understand it is not about them. They understand that even everything that has happened in their life or happened in their ministry is not because of how awesome they are, but because of how awesome God is. And the spiritual person acknowledges that they are just God's fellow workers. We're just doing the work. God has given us, and God is the one who gets to make it all happen. Do you know um, the church in Corinth still exists today? Did you know that? I mean, not that just there are still believers in Corinth, but there's still the current bishop over the, the Greek Orthodox Church in Corinth is Dionysius Mentalos. 
And that church, that group, can track their history all the way back for 80 different bishops over 2,000 years of history. Okay, now we can sit, we can debate, and well, you know, what is Greek Orthodox Church? What does that mean? How, you know, blah, you know, I'm not really interested in doing that. But it is, is amazing to just think of, that, that's 80 different leaders over 2,000 years just serving God's church in the city of Corinth. And still ain't got it right. Probably not. <laughs> Many of us still have problems. But the issue, I mean, there's are stories that we will never hear. And think about, it. think about that in not just our own church at Tanglewood, but the, the American church, the church in our country, and the church all the way back to Peter and Paul that started at Pentecost. There are millions of stories of faithful believers that we will never hear until we get to the other side of eternity. Of people who planted, and people who watered, and people who just you know, dug out with some, a hoe trying to put down some soil. There are so many stories of faithfulness that we will never hear. And yet, all of us, all of them, every believer gets to play a small part in the greatest show on earth. And what God is doing in the world through his church. What a gift that is. So what that should lead us to do is spiritually mature people is to acknowledge, you know, all of us really are just playing a small role in God's plan for the universe. And on a, a more microcosm level, all of us are just playing a small role in God's plan for Tanglewood Bible Fellowship. For whether it, it's me as the pastor or elders or member or people, you feel like you're on the margins. All of us just play a small role in what God is doing in his church. And I don't know his plan for our church. I hope if the Lord tarries 2,000 years that our church will still be here and there will be story after story after story after story of God's faithfulness, of people continuing to submit and continuing to fall after him, to continue to share the gospel, to continue to be faithful to his word, to continue to make disciples. And all of us, the beauty of that is that it's not about me, it's not about you, it's not about any of us. It's just about hey, can we just get to humbly do the work that God has given us? And what a gift that is. What a wonderful thing that God has given us that we just get to go to work with our Father and see what he does in the world. So the spiritually mature person has to acknowledge that. They have to realize that it's not about them. It's not about me, it's not about you, it's not about what we do or don't do. It is just about what God does. And what a joy that we get to do it with him. The third mark of spiritual maturity is that the spiritually mature person does work that lasts. The spiritually mature person does work that lasts. Now, but the immature person that we see, they, they don't do work that lasts. They do work that fades work that passes away. And we see this in 11 where it's, he starts beginning right away in 10, right, describing himself as a skilled master builder. And there's lots of metaphors Paul's using in this chapter. And describing building this beautiful building. And, you know, he lays down the foundation. But he says, at the end of 10, this is kind of the key part of this section, he says, let each take care how he builds upon it. Let each take care how he builds upon it. The warning for us is, okay, as we do the work of God, we need to take care how we're doing it. We need to ask ourselves, are we actually doing God's work or am I just doing my work? Am I actually interested in helping the kingdom of God grow or am I just trying to build my own little kingdom? Or am I distracted? Now what the immature person does is they build work that doesn't last. And in 12, Paul says, now if anyone builds on the foundation... With gold and silver and precious stones and wood, hay and straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. There is a day coming when all that we have done, all that we have done in our life, like the end of Ecclesiastes said, the Lord will judge every single thing we have done in secret and in public. Every thought, every word, every deed, everything will be laid before the throne and 
the way Paul describes it, it will be tested by fire. And we'll see what lasts. That's why he uses the metaphor of, you know, the gold, the silver, the stones, and wood, hay, and straw. Okay, wood, hay, and straw are not going to last when that fire comes. It will be burned up. It will be passed away. Uh, I see an example of this every day as I'm driving down to the church, right off of Plato in the, by the gas station in the railroad tracks. There's that house that burned down, right? But you know what's right there in the midst of all the wreckage and the carnage of that? There's still that big old fireplace. And the fireplace looks pretty fine. It looks good. It looks like you build a house around it, it still works. Why? Well, because that fireplace is not made out of straw or wood or hay. It's made out of stone. And so when the fire came and it burned everything else, that fireplace still remains. It's a reminder, it's just a good example, that there are things that we can do that will pass away, that will be burned. You won't even be able to tell, just like you can't tell or guess, what did that house used to look like? At least I can't. I wasn't here when it was here. But there are things that we can do that will just be burned away by God. And the fire will test out what sort of work each one of us has done. Now this should, this should scare us. Because in 15, or it should give us pause. He says, if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved. But only as through fire. So what, what does he mean by that? Part of what he's talking about is he's saying, I am not just talking about people who are believers and people who are unbelievers. I am not just saying, Corinth, that the believers are going to be good and that all of our work is gold and joy and we will be given all these riches of rewards along with salvation and life will be incredible forever. And unbelievers, they are going to be the ones where all that they have done is passed away and be burned by fire. He's saying, hey, even you believers, even you who have accepted the gospel, who understand, who have been saved by grace, who will get to be in eternity in the new heavens and the new earth with Jesus forever, which is reward enough which will be incredible enough, know that there are some things that you can still do here that will pass away and that you will miss out. There will be things that, that you spend your life doing that come to nothing. Maybe what, are, what are some things? There's lots of things that we can think of. I'm sure you could come up with a whole list of stuff that people can do, even believers can do, that actually is a waste of time. right? Especially you can think of something... You know, maybe your spouse does for fun that you don't understand. You could say, well, that seems like a waste of time. I don't like that. So obviously that, that would burn away. But more seriously, right, there are things that, that we can do. You can learn all you want about the Bible. You could fill up your brain with an encyclopedia-like knowledge and be able to name every person in the genealogies and all of them, right? Maybe even memorize all the genealogies, okay? We'll just say that's your level of Bible knowledge. But if then you never actually apply that and never actually become like Jesus, what is that? That's just work of wood and hay and straw that will pass away. There are things we can do that we can feel really spiritual. We can feel really awesome because we've done X. But we have to ask ourselves, we have to hear the warning of Paul. Are we actually doing work or doing things that will stand all the way through eternity? We, we can earn lots of money on this side of life. We can get the biggest houses. We can get everything that our lives have ever dreamed of, everything we wanted our kids to have and have it all. But guess what? At the end, it all will burn away. And so if we're not generous with it, if we don't appreciate what God has given us, if we're not grateful for it, if we don't honor God in the way that we use it, then what is it? It is just hay and straw that will be burned and pass away. Is it even possible to, be, to build big churches and have big ministries and be focused on influence and fame and power and whatever? And yet, and it looked like you did something, you built something big, but the fire could come and burn it all away and say, hey, actually, you weren't doing any of that for me. You were just doing that for you. And that's true for that. That can also be true for us and how we serve the Lord. We can serve the Lord in ways that actually aren't about him at all. They're just about us. I could go on and on and listen to things. There are so many things that we can do that do this. And maybe you need to sit, you need to reflect, you need to pray, you need to ask the Lord to reveal the things in your own life. Hey, what am I building? Am I doing things that 
are actually going to last into eternity? Am I doing things that actually please you, God? Or am I just wasting my life building a castle on the sand that will all pass away when the tide comes in? And not only that, God continues for some other things that will pass away. In 16 and 17, 17 specifically, he starts going and talking about God's temple. Which actually, if you look at the materials used to describe the building, the gold and the silver and precious stones, it's actually a subtle reference to the temple. It's describing building the temple. But so here he says, hey, don't you guys know that you're God's temple? You and God's spirit dwells within you. And he's talking about them. He's not just talking about them individually, but he's also talking about them as the church, the Corinthian church. He's saying you are God's temple. And if anyone destroys God's temple... God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. That's, again, some harsh words. Part of what Paul is saying is that, hey, if you are actively destroying the work of God, if you are actively harming his temple and his church, Paul has some harsh words. Now, we can think of people, right, or we can think of some, because there are some who actively are working against the church, especially in Corinth. There are those who are filled with sexual sin unrepentantly and going around and saying, God's fine with this. This is wonderful. There are those in the church who are suing each other in court. There are those in the church who are going around and causing up divisions, who are fighting, who are wanting to split and say, hey, let's kick them out. I don't want them anymore. Let's do things my way. I'm the most important. These are the things that are going on in the church in Corinth. And what is Paul saying? They're doing? He's saying, you are destroying God's temple and look out because God will destroy the one who does this. That is harsh. I'm not going to try and blunt that or pretty that up. That should call, make all of us pause a little and realize how much God really cares about his church and his temple, which is you and which is us. Now, that's also, that's, we can think that's true not just for those in Corinth, but we can think of people maybe who are also like this. I'm not naming anybody because we don't need to do that, but you can maybe think of some people who it seems as if they enjoy or spend a lot of their time destroying God's church. They just go, or maybe they jump from church to church to church. I know, have known people like this who it's there at a different church every two years, and before they leave, they cause a big fuss again and fight and yell and get other people to leave because everyone here is the worst ever. Now let's go to this other church. Oh, this is the best church ever. And then the cycle continues. Nope, everybody here is awful as well. Everyone leave. Let's fight. Let's do all this. Right, we can think. I've seen some head nods. Okay, so we can know. We can think of people like this who, as Paul says, what they are doing is they're not just immature, but they are destroying God's church. They are not doing work that lasts. What I do need to say is obviously not everybody who who does things like that is destroying God's church. Not even everybody who criticizes the church is doing this. You need to be careful there. I want to become some tyrannical dictator and say, how dare you say my sermon wasn't very good. You were destroying the temple of God. Get out. Okay, I'm not going to do that. I think that's a misuse of this. Okay, so you need to put that clarification. But... What Paul is saying is that some people are doing this. And some people in your midst are. And you need to understand how serious this is to God. Because one day, all of our lives, all of our work will be tested by fire. And not all of it is going to pass. Some of it is going to burn away. And this kind of stuff is especially going to be burned. Now, the mature person... It's the immature person. The mature person builds work that lasts. The mature person does work that lasts. And what they do is they build this on the foundation of Jesus. In 10, Paul's saying, I'm a builder. I laid a foundation. And others are building upon it. So we should all take care on what are we building upon it. But what are we building upon? 11, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. What is Paul saying? What he is saying is that every single thing in our lives must be built on Jesus. Everything. From A to Z. All of our work. Whatever it is that we do. All of it has to be centered and built upon and resting on the foundation of Jesus Christ. From beginning to end. 
Now, we don't need to over-spiritualize this. This doesn't mean, okay, in everything you do, you better make sure that, you know, you're quoting some liturgy or that you're quoting the Psalms or maybe you're memorizing Scripture or, you know, if you're praying. And if you're not doing that at any point, then that's worth It's going to burn away and, and it's worthless. I'm not saying that. Let's not go, go overboard. Don't need to get weird, although those are all good things, obviously. But what Paul is saying is that everything in our lives must be built on Jesus. Everything. That everything we do should be impacted by Jesus. Everything from the way that we interact with people when we're checking out at the store to the way you're, when you're driving on the road and somebody drives like an idiot and cuts you off or doesn't use their blinker, the way you react to there. Are you building that part of your life on the foundation of Jesus? Some small things to the big things. A spiritually mature person, is all of that is being built on Jesus. And what this means, the, the encouragement part of this, is that for those who are spiritually mature, their work matters into all eternity. Into all eternity. For all time. Even after you and I pass away and die and our bodies fade to dust, what we have done for Jesus matters. What we have done for Jesus does not just matter then because it's cute and someone will tell other people about it. Even as all memory of us fades from the earth, what we have done for Jesus matters into all eternity. Your prayer this morning mattered. Your decision to come and to hear God's word read and to fight to pay attention and to stay awake and to listen to examine yourself, that matters. The way that you responded to your kids when you were upset, the way that you interacted with that person this morning, everything that we do matters. It all matters. It matters to Jesus. And all of it at the throne of God, at the day of judgment when the fire comes, all of those small things that may seem small, may seem like they don't matter, maybe even that prayer in the middle of the night of desperation, that prayer mattered to God. And what we see here is that there is a reward. This is the work 14. If, anyone, if any, the work anyone's built on that foundation survives, he or she will surely receive a reward. It doesn't just matter because it lasts. It doesn't just matter because it pleases Jesus. It doesn't just matter because it helps us grow in spiritual maturity so that we can be more like Jesus. But it also matters because we will be rewarded for it as believers. Obvious question is, what is that reward? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> I've got no clue. I, I can't even... <laughs> it will be where the moths can't get. I can't even begin to venture a guess. But here's what I do know. Whenever you come to something in Scripture and you don't know what something is, you've got to go and rest on what you do know to figure out what you don't know, right? So I don't know what this reward could be, but here are things I do know. We serve a God who is good. We serve a God who is eternally good and gracious. A God who sent His Son down from heaven to die and to save sinners who did not deserve it, who did not ask for it, who then spit on Him and killed Him, and yet God sent His Son for us. So he is incredibly good. So if he is incredibly good and he tells us, hey, me, the good, eternally loving, eternally gracious father of the universe, have something awesome for you. When we get it, we get to open it. It's not going to be socks and underwear. Okay? It's not like that at Christmas. Like, ah, well, what is this, dad? Like my dad, every year at Christmas, we get toothbrushes. Every single year, as long as I can remember, that's the way. there will always be a toothbrush in every stocking. One year he didn't give it, and then there was a revolt, and we were upset that we didn't get the toothbrushes. <laughs> didn't like it before, but we like it now. Right? It's not going to be like that kind of thing. Uh, our God is so, so good. And if he says what we do matters, and that he will test it one day, and if it lasts, there will be a reward. I don't know what kind of reward it could be, but I know that it would be beyond our imagination. I know that even if he told me about it, we might read it and think, eh, I don't know, that sounds okay, I guess, but maybe I'd like this. Because we're human, and we're fleshy, and we're like the Corinthian church. We don't, we're not, haven't reached our full spiritual maturity yet. And so that's part of why I think God doesn't even tell us, because we wouldn't appreciate it. 
What I do know is that it will blow our minds. And if that's true, what we should do is we as believers should focus on doing work that matters. All of it. So our application. So we need to pursue spiritual maturity by pursuing Jesus. That's obvious. If, the, if this is what spiritual maturity looks like and this is what spiritual immaturity looks like, what, what should our response be? Well, let's, let's try and be spiritually mature. Let's try and be like Jesus. We need to continue to grow in the gospel. We need to make sure that we are not, that Paul couldn't come to us and say, hey, I wish I could tell you guys some stuff, but you guys are just a bunch of infants, a bunch of children who won't continue to grow. You just continue to always be annoyed at other people when they do something that you don't like. Wow, you haven't stopped doing, you haven't even gotten any better at that. No, we need to continue to grow. And this growth isn't automatic. Today alone, right, even this morning, doesn't guarantee that you're going to be more like Jesus this week. It doesn't even guarantee you're going to be more like Jesus this year. Just because you're another Christian, maybe even you just read your Bible, that's a good thing, that definitely helps. But so some of us need that warning. Some of us in this room need to be warned and to remember that, hey, just because I've walked with Jesus for a long time doesn't mean that I'm automatically becoming more and more like Jesus. If I'm not actually actively pursuing Jesus, if I'm not continually repenting of my sin, if I'm not resting and renewing myself in God's word, if I'm not calling out to him in prayer. Some of us need that warning. Some of us, again, need encouragement. There, there are many of you in this room that I am probably preaching to the choir. And, and for you, I remind you of, and all of us of as well, but there is a great reward at the end of this. That we are all building a building, an incredible building, that will look even better than the temple at its heyday. Building something that matters into all of eternity. That everything you do, everything you did this morning, the things you will do before you go to bed at night, when you do them and you build your life on Jesus, it matters. And there is a reward for you at the end of this life, whenever you get there. Those of you in this room who are listening who are not believers, you don't need to worry about rewards or becoming more and more like Christ. You need to be reborn. You need to, you need to fall on your face before this good, incredible God and repent of your sins and ask him to deliver you. You need to become an infant and then come walk with us as all of us are chasing Jesus together, trying to get a little bit more and more like him. So wherever you are, wherever you think you are, right, on the scale of spiritual maturity, all of us can be a little bit more like Jesus. I think that all of us can be more like Jesus tomorrow than we were today, even already. I don't know about you, I've already had some moments this morning that I had to repent of. There's going to be more moments when we leave. There's going to be more moments this week, this month. What all of us can do as all of us can chase Jesus and all of us can try slowly but surely to be more and more like him, building a life and doing work that will matter into all of eternity. So this morning we've talked about three marks of spiritual maturity. The first mark is that the spiritually mature person continues to grow in Christ-likeness. They do not just stay the same. They slowly but surely, as the edges get roughed out, become more and more like Jesus. The second mark is the spiritually mature person humbly accepts their role. We all have to acknowledge that what we do is not the most important thing in the room, that God's given us a job to do, and let's humbly accept it and do whatever it is, our small or big part, with humility. Why? Because the third mark, the spiritually mature person does work that lasts into all of eternity. And so our application, again, is that all of us should then pursue spiritual maturity by pursuing Jesus. And let's do work that matters. Join, I want to invite our worship team to come up and then I'll bow our heads in prayer. Lord, I just want to thank you for who you are. Lord, I want to thank you that you would dare to send your son to die on the cross to deliver hopeless sinners like me. Lord, I ask that you would not let us remain as infants. Lord, that you would not let us remain as adolescents. Lord, that wherever we are, we do not want to remain the same. We want to be more like you and more like Jesus today than we were yesterday. 
We want to look back at the end of this year and see how you have changed and caused us to grow and become more and more like you. Lord, would you help us do that? Because without you, we won't even be able to become more like you. Lord, would you encourage us and help us to build everything in our lives on you, on the foundation of Jesus? Would you help us to lift our eyes past what we can see and gaze and peer into eternity to be encouraged and see how everything we do really does matter? Not because people down here say that it does, but because you see it and because you say that it does. We pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we continue to worship through song. That you were able to surrender it all to Jesus this morning and trade your sorrows and your pain and your suffering at the feet of Jesus. I just want to encourage you with this, this blessing and benediction from God at the end of Numbers. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you. Let's be like Jesus this week. You're dismissed.